Hi guys, just wanted to do a really, uh, a really short video on uh, this little uh, six-sided bone here that we know and love as the cuboid. Um, there's a lot of cases of cuboid syndrome um, being diagnosed. Now, it's often uh, used as a sort of all-encompassing term for any, any pain in this sort of dorsolateral region of the foot but it will very often strongly hint at the concept of the cuboid being sort of subluxed or out of position. I am of the personal belief that it's physically impossible for the cuboid to sublux. And furthermore, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with sort of um, the terminology cuboid syndrome. It feels like a catch-all term, which is nowhere near diagnostic enough. And if we're unhappy with terms such as metatarsalgia or shin splints, I just can't see why we wouldn't be equally unhappy with the term um, cuboid syndrome. So let's take a little while just to refresh our memories on, on the anatomy of this region, just how complex it actually is. If we think about bony articulations, we know that the cuboid um, articulates uh, posteriorly with the calcaneus anteriorly with the fourth and fifth metatarsals and medially with the lateral cuneiform and also there'll very often be a, a facet for the navicular here as well. Uh, if we think ligamentously we've got the long and short plantar ligaments between the calcaneus and the cuboid uh, plantarly obviously, the um, dorsal calcaneocuboid ligament um, and also numerous other interosseous ligaments which hopefully you can see on the screen uh, right now. Uh, tendons Obvious one to discuss initially is peroneus longus, which although doesn't insert, does groove the cuboid through this sulcus here. Um, we know that tibialis posterior has some attachment here as well, and some literature will suggest that there are fibres of flexor hallucis brevis also, which have some linkages. If we think about uh, dynamically, motion, and we'll focus on the calcaneocuboid joint just for, for brevity, um, we know that there is movement and motion in all three anatomical planes here. We know from the bone pin studies that the mean total range of this joint uh, can sometimes uh, be greater than the equivalent at the subtalar joint in some individuals. It also shouldn't be a surprise to anyone when we say that the motion here and the kinematics here are wildly variable and different from person to person. So this brings about Three, three big questions for me. Firstly, <clears throat> given the relative constraint in the area of, from the adjacent bones, the ligamentous structures, the, the tenderness units, do we feel it's physically possible for the cuboid to sublux or move out of position? Question two, what, well again, given the, uh, the huge variation in, in motion here and anatomy here, what sort of reference points of normality are we using that give us the confidence to declare exactly when this is subluxed or out of position. And thirdly, um, numerous anatomical structures we've discussed here, all of which could individually or in combination be sources and contributors of pain in this region. And of course there's other anatomy we haven't discussed, there's neural tissue, the uh, calcaneocuboid labrum, for example, etc. Therefore, are we happy with uh, cuboid syndrome as a diagnosis uh, for us to continue uh, using it as such? Is it specific enough and do we feel it gives us enough information to formulate appropriate management plans for our patients? Uh, really look forward to hearing what people think about this. Feel, please do feel free to leave a comment and, and hopefully we can have some, some good discussion.